This is Jocko Podcast number 101 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. Second Lieutenant Bernard Wilfred Long was a smart young man who went to Birmingham University at age of 16 back in 1912. He was commissioned in the West Yorkshire Regiment in January of 1916, and Bernard, or Burn, as his family called him, served in World War I in France, and he wrote this letter to his father in early August of 1916. He said, we've been having it awfully wet here during the last day or two, And my word, talk about mud. It's simply awful. I get into mud up to my knees. I can take a sporting risk as well as any of them. And shells have got no fear for me. I've seen great big burly chaps who do nothing but curse and drink and get down and pray like a child when there is a bombardment on. And they don't care who sees them. And no one dares to joke about it. I've just heard from a pal of mine from Brockton who went down to the Somme when I came here, and he says he's been over the lid seven times in attacks on the Bosch line. Pretty awful that, isn't it? And I marvel he's alive to tell the tale. He wrote another letter to his mother on August 11th, 1917. I am off by an early train tomorrow for the rest billets behind the firing line where we shall be for a time to get to know our men, etc. I am going up with two pals and we are all pleased. I shall think of you all while I'm up there and know you won't forget me. We're fighting hard now and it's a serious game. We're all ready to lay down everything if need be. And if God wills, I'm ready. So goodbye and wish me luck. Your loving son, Burn. And Second Lieutenant Bernard Wilford Long was killed in action at age 21 at the Battle of Langmark. On August 16th, 1917, 400 men from his battalion went into action. All 10 of the officers from the battalion died, along with 264 of the men. On September 11th, 1918, there's another young man, Sergeant David Kerr, an American who dropped out of Columbia University to fight in World War I. He sent a letter to his mother the day before the attack on St. Miel in France. And he wrote, tomorrow the first totally American drive commences and it gives me inexpressible joy and pride to know that I shall be present to do my share. Should I go under, therefore, I want you to know that I went without any terror of death, and that my chief worry is the grief my death will bring to those so dear to me. Since having found myself and Mary, there has been much to make life sweet and glorious. But death, while distasteful, is in no way terrible. I feel wonderfully strong to do my share well, and for my sake, you must try to drown your sorrow in the pride and satisfaction, the knowledge that I died well in so clean a cause as is ours should bring you. Remember how proud I have always been of your superb pluck Keep Elizabeth's future in mind and don't permit my death to bow your head. My personal belongings will all be sent to you. Your good taste will tell you which to send to Mary. May God bless and keep you, dear heart, and be kind to little Elizabeth and those others I loved so well. David.
the end. And while the Americans actually broke through the German lines in the attack, they suffered 7,000 casualties in 72 hours of fighting, and 20-year-old 20 year, 20 year David Kerr was among the dead. And that attitude, that attitude where death is not feared, we can find examples of it in so many different places. A great example is from the American Civil War, from a man by the name of Sullivan Balu. Now, after the battle at Fort Sumter in 1861, President Lincoln called on the states to form up militia troops to put down the rebellion. And Sullivan Balu, who was born in Rhode Island, was one of those volunteers. And he was commissioned a major in the 2nd Rhode Island Infantry Regiment. He was third in command. And the second rhode island infantry regiment moved to washington and joined the union army of northeastern virginia and on the 14th of july 1861 from washington sullivan wrote his wife a letter and here are some excerpts from that letter my very dear sarah The indications are very strong that we shall move in a few days, perhaps tomorrow. Lest I should not be able to write you again, I feel impelled to write lines that may fall under your eye when I shall be no more. Our movement may be one of a few days duration and full of pleasure. And it may be one of severe conflict and death to me. Not my will, but thine, O God, be done. If it is necessary that I should fall on the battlefield for my country, I am ready. I have no misgivings about or lack of confidence in the cause in which I am engaged, and my courage does not halt or falter. I know how strongly American civilization now leans upon the triumph of the government. And how great a debt we owe to those who went before us through the blood and suffering of the revolution. And I am willing, perfectly willing, to lay down all my joys in this life to help maintain this government and to pay that debt. But, my dear wife, when I know that with my own joys, I lay down nearly all of yours and replace them in this life with cares and sorrows. When, after having eaten for long years the bitter fruit of orphanage myself, I must offer it as their only sustenance to my dear little children. Is it weak or dishonorable while the banner of my purpose floats calmly and proudly in the breeze that my unbounded love for you, my darling wife and children, should struggle in fierce though useless contest with my love of country? I cannot describe to you my feelings on this calm summer night when 2,000 men are sleeping around me many of them enjoying their last, perhaps before that of death. And I, suspicious that death is creeping behind me with his fatal dart, am communing with God, my country, and you. Sarah, my love for you is deathless. It seems to bind me to you with mighty cables that nothing but the omnipotence could break. And yet, My love of country comes over me like a strong wind and bears me irresistibly on with these chains to the battlefield. The memories of blissful moments I've spent with you come creeping over me, and I feel most gratified to God and to you 
that I have enjoyed them so long. And hard it is for me to give them up and burn to ashes the hopes of future years when, God willing, we might still have lived and loved together and seen our sons grow up honorable to manhood around us. I have, I know, but few small claims upon divine providence, but something whispers to me. Perhaps it is wafted, perhaps it is the wafted prayer of my little Edgar that I shall return to my loved ones unharmed. If I do not, my dear Sarah, never forget how much I love you. And when my last breath escapes me on the battlefield, it will whisper your name. Forgive my many faults and the many pains I have caused you. How thoughtless and foolish I have oftentimes been. How gladly would I wash out with my tears every little spot upon your happiness and struggle with all the misfortune of this world to shield you and my children from harm. But I cannot. I must watch you from the spirit land and hover near you while you buffet the storms with your precious little freight and wait with sad patience till we meet to part no more. But, O oh Sarah, if the dead can come back to this earth and flit unseen around those they love, I shall always be near you. In the garish day and in the darkest night, amidst your happiest scenes and gloomiest hours, always, always. And if there be a soft breeze upon your cheek, it shall be my breath. Or if cool air fans your throbbing temple, it shall be my spirit passing by. Sarah, do not mourn me dead. Think I am gone and wait for thee, for we shall meet again. As for my little boys, they will grow as I have done and never know a father's love and care. Little Willie is too young to remember me long and my blue-eyed Edgar will keep my frolics with him amongst the dimmest memories of his childhood. Sarah, I have unlimited confidence in your maternal care and your development of their characters. I call God's blessing upon them. Oh, Sarah, I wait for you there. Come to me and lead thither my children. Sullivan. And on July 21st, 1861, the regiment took part in the first Battle of Bull Run. And as one of the senior officers... Sullivan went in front on horseback to direct his men and he was hit by a cannonball that tore off his right leg and also killed his horse. And he died from his wound a week after the battle while a prisoner of the Confederate Army at age 32. Again, an individual obviously prepared to make the ultimate sacrifice. 